to this morning from the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, especially the verses from 32 to 34. Mark chapter 10 from verse 32 to verse 34. So far, brothers and sisters, in our journey through the Gospel of Mark, we have seen and we have learned who the Lord Jesus is. We have seen how the people were astonished at his teaching. And how there in chapter 1 of Mark and verse 22, we are told that he taught them as one having authority and not like the scribes. Furthermore, furthermore, when you turn to Mark chapter 10, uh, chapter 1 and verse 27, Mark chapter 1 and verse 27, you will read there, then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And so the Lord Jesus Christ was being shown to the people, and the people had, well, had heard what he taught, and they were all astonished at his teaching. They were also astonished at his miracles. Look at what we are told there in chapter 4, for example, and verse 41. How they were astonished at his miracle, and how his miracles led them to uh, fear exceedingly, as we are told there in verse 41, and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? And so they saw and witnessed the miracles performed by our Lord Jesus Christ and they asked, they asked who can this be? The identity of the person who performed such incredible miracles in their sight and for their good, brothers and sisters. The answer, of course, is that the Lord Jesus Christ is none other than the Lord himself in human flesh. This is what was proclaimed, meant to be proclaimed by the coming of John the Baptist. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 3, there was this prophecy in the New Testament that says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. We know that John the Baptist was the voice of one crying in the wilderness and his mission was to come and prepare the way of the Lord. And it would be the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ indeed. You see, brothers and sisters, so far in the Gospel of Mark, you have learned who Jesus is and who is he? He is the Lord. You learn that he is the Son of God. That's what you learn from his baptism. Recorded for us in chapter 1 and verse 11. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is the beloved son of God. And this is known even to the unclean spirits, the demons. In chapter 3 and verse 11 we read, And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, they fell down before him, and they cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. And it is true that Jesus is the Son of God. And you ought to come to the same conclusion, that He is none other than Jehovah God, the Son of God. For He, the Lord Jesus Christ, He showed that He is God by the fact that He has the authority to forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin because sin is against God, the God of heaven and earth. And so it is He and He Himself has the power to forgive sinners. And that is what we are told when you turn to chapter 2. Verse 5 you read, When Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And this caused a lot of unhappiness. And we are told that the unhappiness has to do with this in verse 7. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And the fact that he forgives is meant to tell you, brothers and sisters, that the Lord is teaching you and revealing to you that he is none other than God himself who can forgive sins. Not only does he exhibit 
the authority to forgive sin, he also shows us, brothers and sisters, that he has power over life and over death. Look at what you are told there from the example of the daughter of Jairus recorded in Mark chapter 5. Look at what you are told in verse 41 to verse 42. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha to me, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the dead girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement to witness, brothers and sisters, a dead girl coming back to life, the power of our Lord Jesus Christ over life and death. Now, brothers and sisters, I have only merely drawn your attention to some of these things that you learn about who Jesus is. And I hope that all these reminders will indeed stir in your hearts a great respect and reverence and love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Then as you look at all the challenges in your life at the current moment, whether it is COVID-19 and the problems that COVID-19 has brought to you in terms of your work, your business, your health, or your future uncertainty, beloved brothers and sisters, look at this person, the person of Jesus Christ, and put in Him, place your hope in Him, put your all in Him, because He is here presented to you as none other than God Himself in human flesh. Isn't He, brothers and sisters, given the name Emmanuel? And isn't Emmanuel meaning God with us? Oh, brothers and sisters, this morning, as you come to worship God together, come and with His confidence that you are coming to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and He is the promised Emmanuel. From this passage that I have drawn your attention to this morning, in Mark chapter 10, verse 32 to verse 34, I want to draw your attention to three important lessons. Look here firstly, brothers and sisters, in verse 32, that you need to focus on this person, Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at what you are told there in verse 32. Then he took the twelve, referring to the apostles, he took the twelve aside again. And the word again is important, brothers and sisters, because it means again as in he did it before, and now he repeated it again for a reason. He did it again because it was necessary to call the attention of the apostle to these things. Again, he says, all that he had told them, he had told them before. He had told them before what would soon happen to him. Earlier, he had already told them, but they did not take it seriously. And now the Lord had to call them to it and say, Did I not tell you? And do I need to repeat to you the same thing? And it is needful for me to repeat to you because it is necessary and important for you to pay attention and to focus on this. Look at what you are told there in verse 32 about the disciples, the twelve of them. You learn there, brothers and sisters, two important words that describe their state of mind. We, you are told there that they were amazed. And then later on, they were afraid. They were amazed and they were afraid. And why were they amazed? And what was it that they were afraid of? Well, it has got to do, brothers and sisters, what, with what they have thought that they have heard from our Lord Jesus Christ. Not fully. The earlier things that the Lord had told them as to what soon happened to him, they did not bother to clarify as we have told that. In chapter 9, verse 31 to verse 32, especially 32, but they did not understand this saying and they were afraid to ask him. But they nonetheless understood that the Lord Jesus was saying that something bad was going to happen to him and something about the fact that he would die. And that really caused them to be amazed at the Lord Jesus Christ and to be afraid to at the same time. Why so? Because if you look at what you are told there in verse 32 of our Lord, we are told there that the Lord was going before them to Jerusalem. 
going before them means they, that the Lord Jesus Christ, He was walking in front of them. He was walking ahead of them. And He was walking with confidence towards Jerusalem. But did He not tell us that He would be killed and that He would face His enemies? And look at Him! Isn't it amazing? Isn't it astonishing? Look, look, look! Our Lord! He is walking even in front of us. He was not afraid. And so they were amazed at his courage. His courage to face his enemies. His courage to face all that he had already told them would happen, that he would be killed. They didn't know why. They didn't want to find out why. But they knew that he would be killed because he said, and yet he was not afraid. And then, well, they were amazed at the same time, they were afraid. What were they afraid of? They looked at the Lord Jesus and they were amazed, astonished by his, his courage. And at the very same time, they were, in their own hearts, afraid of their own safety. They knew that the Lord, something more bad would happen to him, he would be killed. Then what's going to happen to us? They were afraid of their own safety. They were not focusing on the safety of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were more interested in their own well-being. And this is clearly shown in what we have read this morning, especially from the section from verse 25. Now about two of the disciples, two of the twelve, James and John. The Lord had only told them what would happen to him that he would be killed, even if they did not understand why and the, 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 the fullness of the message. But look, brothers and sisters, they were amazed and they were afraid. And yet, in the state of being afraid, they were thinking of themselves. They want to be in position of power and authority. And that is exactly what you find in the world today, especially in the Church of Jesus Christ, too, among people who claim to be Christians, isn't it? They are not really concerned about Jesus or the Church or the condition of the Church in the world. They are not concerned about brothers and sisters who are in persecution. They are more concerned about themselves. And they are willing to abandon Christ. They are willing to renounce Christ. They are willing to leave the church. If there is something that will protect their own interests and their well-being. And I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, what about your case? Do you see here a serious problem? That they were afraid for their own selves. They were not afraid as to what will happen to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is to this mental condition, this spiritual state, that you find our Lord Jesus Christ calling again the apostles for what He had earlier told them, the message. Look at what you are told there in Mark chapter 10 and verse 32. Then He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them, the things that would happen to him. He already told them earlier on in Mark chapter 9 verse 31. But it was necessary by their action and by their state of mind and their spiritual state for the Lord to call them back to this. Listen! This will happen. This must happen. This is what is going to happen. I am going to Jerusalem and they will kill me. Brothers and sisters, you need to know this, that the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem was not an accident. It was not something that caught God by accident, by, 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 by surprise. You must know, brothers and sisters, and that was the intention for me to read for you, for example, this morning, Psalm 22, that what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ was what God had already made known in the Old Testament before He was even born. And so, when the things happened, even right here, the Lord was telling the disciples what would happen, so that when it happened, the Lord wanted the disciples to be prepared, to, to, to look back and say, ah, Exactly. He already told us and warned us. Isn't it amazing? He must be none other than God because He knew the future before the future came. 
And so it is, brothers and sisters, I call your attention to these. I do not know this morning what is in front of you and what is hiding in your hearts. But I want you to know that I know someone who do know, who he does know what is in the future and he does search your hearts and know exactly what you are trembling about. He is none other than the one who said to the disciples here in verse 32, the things that would happen to him before it happened to him. And so, brothers and sisters, it is placing yourselves in the hand of the Christ that we are reading here and we are learning here that can bring you true peace and true peace of mind and heart as you look into your future and as you go through and maneuver through this very difficult health crisis. Brothers and sisters, trusting in his destined death and trusting in his destined resurrection is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You realize that it is not about his death. The death of Jesus and his rising again, they always go together. You cannot talk about him dying on the cross and full stop because that's not the end of the story. It must be that he died on the cross for the sin of his people and that three days after that he rose from the dead for their justification and their future hope that God has accepted his sacrifice on the cross for the sins of his people. I call you now to look at this. In your state of mind and you don't know what is troubling you, but brothers and sisters, focus on this. Focus on what Jesus said. Focus on this fact that it was necessary for Jesus to call the twelve to this message again. And so this morning I call you again to this same message. Will you breathe deeply? Will you give time to think about this? The fact that God had already announced that this is what is going to happen to Jesus when he came. That's our second point, brothers and sisters. I want to draw your attention to what the Holy Bible wants you to learn about what Jesus has done for you. Look at what you learned there in verse 32, verse 34. Then he once again read for you, for it is important that you have this message clearly in your mind and heart. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. It is written, it will happen just as God has written in the Old Testament. You find a mention here of the city Jerusalem. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. It was the chosen city of God in ancient time. When the people were living in tabernacles or tents, God instructed the people to build for him his own tent or his own tabernacle. And when the time came and the people started to settle down in their permanent cities and towns and started to build permanent homes of bricks and, and, and stones and, and, and permanently, you find God instructing the, his people to construct for him his own home, the temple of God in his chosen city, the city of Jerusalem. And you find God giving instruction that he would meet with his people in his own home on earth, the temple. And that the people, wherever they were, is spread out in the towns and nations around the world. They would come to God if they were to come and seek him in his chosen address, his chosen venue, his chosen house to seek him. And so the ancient people were taught to come to make sacrifices for their sins in order to be reconciled to God, they would come and seek His face in worship and in prayer and to give their tithes to Him and to celebrate the Passover to brothers and sisters with the killing of the Paschal Lamb. When the time came from the, for the true Paschal Lamb to be sacrificed, the Lamb of God that had come to be killed for the sins of His people, we are told that the Lord Jesus Christ made his way to Jerusalem because there in Jerusalem 
he would be the one to fulfill all the prophecies concerning the Lamb of God who would come to buy, to die for his people. He would come to be the propitiation for their sins and he would come to atone for them. That is why the Lord Jesus made his way to Jerusalem and it was in Jerusalem that all these things concerning his suffering and ultimately his sacrifice and death and resurrection would take place. Look at what we are told there. We are told that he will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. And that exactly happened. But that was already told in the Old Testament by the prophet Zechariah in chapter 11 and verse 12 of Zechariah. He will be sold and betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Exactly. Taking place in a time as we are told in Matthew 26 and verse 15. Then again, brothers and sisters, then the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be condemned to death. For the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We are told clearly that in Isaiah 53 and verse 14, that Jesus must be condemned to death. Why was he condemned? Did he commit any crime? Was he guilty of any sin? No! Then why was Jesus condemned to death? What kind of death? Death as a sentence, as a punishment, was given for all the criminals. But Jesus was no criminal. You see, he was condemned to death for his people. Taking upon the sins and the crimes of his people upon himself. And as the Lamb of God, he carried their sin and he died for them. That is why he was condemned. And he was delivered to the Gentiles. That is what you are told that in verse 33. We are told that he was delivered to the Gentiles. You must understand this very well, brothers and sisters. That in the Holy Bible, the world is generally divided into two groups. You have the Jews and you have the non-Jews. The Jews, they are known as the Jews. The non-Jews was given the title the Gentiles or the nations. When you have the Jews condemning the Lord Jesus to death, and then the participation of the Gentiles as well, delivered to the Gentiles, the Jews. They were joined in hands with the rest of the world in condemning the Lord Jesus and putting him to death. In other words, it represented the whole world rejecting the Son of God and condemning him to death. All have sinned. You cannot say, I'm not a Jew, I'm not, I'm not a Roman. That's not the point. You are a human. You are a son of Adam. You are a daughter of Eve. You were there when they crucified our Lord. And you participated in the rejection of Him who is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And so you are told in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, reading for you from verse 28 to 29, verse 29 we read, and though they find no reason for death in him, they ask Pilate that he should be put to death. No reason, no cause for him to die. And yet they ask that he be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. What is this man to teach you? The Bible clearly teaches you, brothers and sisters, all that was written concerning him. All that was already written before he was even born concerning him. All these things will happen to him and all these things did happen to him just as God said and just as Jesus told the disciples before the events took place. These are all meant to teach you, brothers, sisters and children, that the gospel is true. The same way the Bible teaches you now, that in the future there is a road to heaven and there is a road to hell. And those who reject the Lord, those who reject forgiveness, those who will not be reconciled to God, they will not be with God. No matter how sincere you are in your religion, you are sincerely wrong. Because there is only one Savior and there is only one road to heaven. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so if you are not here, you will never be saved, you will never see the face of God. And so will you be this message. Long before you die, long before the end of the world, will you accept this message? If what Jesus said before came true, will you accept this warning from Him too? as you await the second return. Then you are told, not only was he delivered to the Gentiles, he was mocked, he was scourged, and he was spit upon. The word is scourged means to be flogged severely, to be flogged, to be whipped severely. And that's exactly the record you find in the Holy Bible. I read for you what the ancient prophets it said before it took place. You have already read from Psalm 22, where you are told of the ridicule that he suffered. All those who see me, verse 7, they shoot out their lips and they shake their heads and he trusted in God. Let him rescue him. Let him rest, deliver him since he delights in him. The mocking, the rock, mocking and then the, the, the short statements that came out from those religious people. Then if you turn to Isaiah 50, 5, 0. Isaiah 50, 5, 0, And verse 6, you read about this. I gave my back to those who struck me. Many will say they whipped him. Severely, tearing his back apart, bloody and wounded. And my cheeks, they slapped him, remember? And my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and from spitting. Long before Jesus suffered all these things, at the hand of those who dated him, the Old Testament said that he will suffer all this fear, all this shame on behalf of his feet. I do not know how you feel when you read about all these things that happened to Jesus. It will happen, it did happen, and now today, as you look back, what does it mean to your hearts? Do you feel bad? Do you feel Third, do you feel convicted that it is for your sin, brothers, sisters, and children, that Jesus went through all this suffering? It is for your salvation that people spit on him. To spit on somebody is the final sign of rejection and abuse. Pui! Who? Son of God, pui! I don't believe in you. Reject you. Cast you aside. And that was what they did to your Lord and to your Savior. And finally, you are told that in verse 34 that he was killed like a criminal by crucifixion. That was predicted as you learned there in Psalm 22 earlier. In verse 16 you read, They pierced my hands and my feet. You must understand at the point of opposition, David didn't know what it meant by the pierced my hands and my feet. The Holy Spirit taught him and so he wrote it down. But this form of cruel punishment for criminals was not invented yet. It will be many years, hundreds of years later, in the time of the Greek Empire, that this torture was invented and then adopted by the Romans after. Crucifixion was a very painful and a horrible way to put to death a criminal. But then in the ancient time, it was already made known that Jesus, long before it was invented, that Jesus would suffer such a death, that he would be pierced by the cross at Calvary. He was destroyed, and he they put him to death, and they buried him. But you see, brothers and sisters, being the Son of God, he cannot be made dead. If he remained dead, he will be just like you and I. He will be another ancient hero at best, like all the ancient heroes of China and ancient heroes of the West. But he was no ancient hero because he is the one and only one who destroyed death by rising again from the dead. Again means he was once alive and then again means he died and again means he came back alive. And that is what you are told. 
two verses, a very important verses in the Old Testament that you must not forget. Psalm 16, 1, 6 and verse 10 says, For you will not leave my soul in soul, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Meaning to say that the Holy One of God, Jesus Christ, will not rot and will not decay in the grave. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. And in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2, you are told, After two days, He will revive us. On the third day, He will rise, He will raise us up that we may live in His sight. And so we are told here again, it's a prophecy, a prediction of something that will happen on the third day. And so it is concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. The prophet Jonah was three days and three nights in the womb of the gigantic fish in the small Mediterranean Sea. And Jesus said, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the, in the belly of the fish, so it will be the same for the Son of God. Meaning to say, it's three days and three nights, and then He will come back alive. And so Jesus rose from the dead. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ called the disciples who were troubled, who were afraid of their own safety and future, to consider this fact of what God has said about Him. And He was going in front of them. He was facing the future with courage because this was the reason why he was born and for this reason and mission he had come and they ought to place their hope and future in these things that Jesus has come to accomplish. They should not be afraid. And so you should not be afraid as you look into the future. Persecution should not destroy you. Enemies should not destroy you. Your problems in life should not destroy you. But you must be able to be in all hope, trusting in God. That just as He has promised the coming and the work of Jesus Christ, He will keep His promise to you, to see you to the end of your days on earth, and to usher you into His holy presence for a world that is getting ready for you. When Adam and Eve sinned, God promised to send the seed of the woman. The same promise was made known to Abraham and then to David concerning the Messiah that God would send. That he would send, as it were, a lamb, a blemish, uh, 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 unblemished lamb, the, the lamb of God, and he would come. And just like the priests of old making animal sacrifices for the sins the people committed against God, this one land, this true land, this Son of God will come like a land. And this Son of God who is of infinite value and worth, He would come and take the place and be the substitute to the people that He has come to save. Brothers and sisters, do you believe in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord? Do you value it? Do you trust in Him? Do you always think about this, that nothing will happen to me because if Jesus has died for me, what else can happen to me unless He allows me for my own spiritual good to train me, to stretch me, to prepare me for His service in the world to come. And so I call you to focus on this gospel message, the coming and death of Jesus Christ for sinners. The last point I want to quickly draw your attention to is this, brothers and sisters, you need to focus on this, and this is why God called the apostles to get back to this message again. They needed, and you needed to know why Jesus must die and rose again for sinners. Recently, someone asked me this, when I make mention about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died for sinners. The person said, if God wants to forgive sinners, why can't God just forgive her? Just forgive her? Why must God make it so complicated and so painful to send Jesus Christ and make Him die on the cross and then three days later make Him rise again from the dead? So complicated. Why can't God just say, I forgive you? To stop. See, brothers and sisters, the person failed to see that sin is fatal. And sin is serious. 
that the wages of sin, the consequence of sin, is death. Sin has consequences. This is what the world today, this is what people today do not understand. That is why they take sin lightly, they joke about sin. Brothers and sisters, a lot of people think COVID-19, if you get it, you get it. Uh. You get it, that means it's just like flu. After a while, you take medicine, you go to the hospital, we, and then you get that quality. After that, you come back, oh, you are, you are already recovered, and then you are already guaranteed for life to be immune against this same virus. But they fail to see, you see, that the government is very worried for people to get this COVID-19 coronavirus because of the long-term consequences of this virus. They are only looking at the coronavirus with a very light-hearted way, realizing not okay, failing to see that, that there is long-term consequence to this virus. The same way, brothers and sisters, will say, if God were to forgive sinners without punishing sin, God would be unjust and unholy because He had already said the wages of sin is death. He had already said that sin has consequences and therefore He cannot take back His word. He has already put it in this world. He has already set natural laws. He says that there is a law of gravity. There is no such thing as sometimes you jump from a high-rise building, sometimes you do not die because at that point God cut, off, God cut off the law of gravity and you bounce up again. There is no such thing, brothers and sisters. You must not take sin lightly. Sin has consequences. Sin kills, sin destroys, sin separates, brothers and sisters. You do not see the seriousness of sin that is why you think that God can just simply put it aside and spare you the consequence of sin. You need to look at the cost that God paid for the salvation of those He came to save. The cost, brothers and sisters, is God sacrificing His own Son, His beloved Son, how He sent from the beauty of heaven into this world to be born, to suffer, to be spit upon, to be mocked, to be rejected, to, to be put to death. And how he had to go through death and remain dead for three days. Oh, brothers and sisters, the death of Jesus Christ is meant to open your eyes to this realization that sin is serious and there is a serious repercussion in sin. Sin will find you out and sin, big or small sin, sin, will kill you. It is a poison that will bring upon death. And there is no amount of liquid you can drink. No hospital will be able to resuscitate you. Sin kills unless you are saved and delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why God sent His Son, God's plan to save His people. That God is just and holy. The wages of sin is death. In order to save his people, he gave his son the gift of God, his eternal life. How? By the giving of his son to be the substitute to be the one who died on behalf of his people. For he will save his people from their sin. There is no other name under heaven, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. That is why, brothers and sisters, the apostles need to look at this message again. They need to hear this message again. And they need to hear more oh, that he will be killed. They need to know that he will rise again. The sad thing is the apostles did not take this seriously. They went on to fight over who is going to be the greatest. And when everything happened, you find that when the Lord was taken, they denied him too. Peter said, I never knew this guy. I don't know him. You are, you are wrong. I don't know this guy. He, he denied Jesus three times. They all fled. Even when someone came back and said that we saw the Lord, and the Lord has risen from the dead, none of the apostles believed. None of them believed until the Lord revealed to them. 
and say to them and recall for them, did I not tell you so before all this thing happened? And then they remember, and then they believe. Oh brothers, and my dear sisters, will you believe? Do you need to wait until you come to a point where you are severely sick? You are about to die before you think about this more deeply. How will you, from this point on, be happy, rejoicing, thank God for this hope? That God has sent His Son to die for my sin. I have Jesus, the Lamb of God, who has come to save me. And in Him, I am saved. And nothing will happen to me because He loved me. Will you obey Him? Will you walk with Him? Will you, brothers and sisters, come and serve Him sincerely, honestly? And will you fear Him and obey Him and carry your cross and walk with Him? Beloved brothers and sisters, what is hindering you? What is hindering you? What is stopping you? Let no one stop you. Let nothing stop you. Come this morning. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll be saved.